What's going on guys? So we had a major wind event come through and I came out here, pulled all the slides in just to make sure that we didn't run the risk of uh, tearing off any of the slide top awnings. And that's a big thing that you guys need to be aware of if you are getting an RV that is equipped with slide top awnings. Basically what those are, are these awnings that are right here, that top one right there. And when the slide comes out, it's on top of that specific awning. And they work really well to keep the top of your slide outs nice and clean if you're going to be under any type of foliage or leaves, branches, things like that that might drop uh, anything on top of them. But you also have to be very careful because if it gets really, really windy, you can actually risk tearing them off or just causing them to flap and stretch and do all sorts of crazy things. So if the wind comes in really, really strong and you have your RV with the slides out, you may want to consider retracting them a little bit just so you don't have as much of a surface area for the wind to pull on. But I'm coming back out today because we're going to go ahead and put the slides back out and get this thing set up so I can use it a little bit more. A lot of folks still commenting on our choice of uh, ground cover right here. We have the geotextile fabric with about two and a half, three inches of this uh, reclaimed asphalt material. And it's working really, really well still for what we are using it for. So, you know, the entire goal was just to be able to provide a temporary spot for us to keep the fifth wheel on our property that eventually we can kind of return back to grass because we're gonna be putting a barn up. But you can see I used one of these little pads that I got off of Amazon on the ground here. These things are rated at like 60,000 pounds. It's pretty crazy. And it just helped keep the actual leveling leg from having to drop down too far. Gave it a much wider surface area to be able to uh, stabilize across. The rest of them are just fine. The front jacks themselves don't actually uh, extend down that far. And mainly because the front jacks slide into the main tube housing. So I have the ability to drop those down without having to extend them like this completely from the main shaft. Anyways, we're gonna go and throw the slides back out on this thing. Hang tight, I'll be right back. Okay, so we have all the slides out now, and you can see the slide top awning right up here. Gonna come around the back, kind of take a look at what we got going on here. This is where we have our power connected. Have this other extension cord run into my father's class B, which I did a video on if you missed that. Coming around this way, got the uh, little sewer tote right here from Camco. Got, we just spread a lot of snake away around the whole perimeter of the RV, so there's a bit of a mothball smell going on right now. You can see up here we got slide top awning out. Over here as well. And I'm just doing a quick little walk around inspection of everything, making sure that prior to me coming out here in the middle of that wind and rain event, didn't see any damage take place. Well, all looks pretty good. But yeah, it is so great having this out here now and not having to, to keep it in a storage facility and pay all that money for storage because you know those two spots that I got and I had just recently gotten the second spot, the two that were side by side at the storage facility, that cost me a lot of money, like 530, 520, $530 just to keep it out there at those two spots. And the reason I had the two spots was so I could have room to be able to do videos out there because when you're, you know, scrunched right up against another RV, you really don't have the room you might need to do the things you need to do. But this is it. We are all nice and set up out here. Everything's nice and clean. The pad is working out perfectly. I mean, it is absolutely awesome having this here. And, you know, if I start growing grass on it or vegetation or anything like that, I'll just come out and spray it, just pull it out or whatever I need to do. But for now, this is working out perfectly and it gives me the exact type of spot that I'm looking for. And it didn't cost me much. That's probably the key. All of this, this entire project right here, including the geotextile fabric, you know, the reclaimed asphalt, everything. And I had the tractor, so I went ahead and with the help of my father, put all this stuff down on here. And we have it extended out 100 feet that way. And it's 15 feet wide. Probably cost us all of 500 bucks, roughly. Maybe 600 bucks, five to $600. And that's for everything. So if you have the space for it, it's an option as long as you understand what some of the limitations are. It's not like pouring asphalt down. It's not like chip and seal. It's not like concrete. You know, it's not like doing a really, really high end, you know, gravel driveway where you excavate down main thing we have here is three feet of sandy loam that is above clay so you're not going to dig three feet down to be able to put 
you know, a gravel parking spot in place. So for us, this works out perfectly. All of this weight is eventually going to kill any of the ground vegetation underneath it. And we have a pretty nice level spot here that works out real well. Okay, so now we're inside of our 2021 Coachman Brookstone 398 MBL. You can just tell, look at the windows and the view that we have here at our property. I mean, this is pretty phenomenal because you, you might think that that's all fake trees back there and you know, you're just looking at a picture. If I open up one of these shades, you can just see how lush and full it all is. But it is absolutely gorgeous out here. Okay, so on to the point of today's video. When I posted the video a few weeks ago about the Puma Destination Series travel trailer, a lot of folks wanted to know what is a destination travel trailer, what is a park model travel trailer, and how do they differ in terms of construction design and use case versus a standard bumper pole travel trailer or even a fifth wheel. So let's talk about that. So right off the bat, one of the things most people notice about a park model or a destination model is the front end. It's actually very difficult to find park model units at dealerships, but if you do run across one, they will look very similar to a destination travel trailer in that they tend to be very tall, very long, and the front tends to be perfectly flat. And the reason for that is because both destination and park model travel trailers are really designed to be left at a location for a longer period of time. They're not designed to be towed around as much. That's one of the reasons why both a destination and a park model will typically have a lower grade tire or not as much of a suspension system for the axles or they're going to have that flat front end they might not even have a power front tongue jack you're going to see them relatively stripped down from a traveling perspective because a lot of people will get them they'll move them out to a property and they'll just keep them there now what's the difference between a destination style and a park style well that is actually a pretty easy one to tell you a destination style travel trailer is going to have holding tanks. It's going to give you the ability to take it out to a piece of property, maybe a lease, maybe a temporary spot that you're going to be at for six, 10 months, a year, whatever. And you would be responsible for either removing waste from the unit and taking it somewhere, moving it to a dump station, or you have connections there for it. A park model unit, on the other hand, is typically not going to have holding tanks. And that simply means that wherever you put it, you need to have some type of utility there. You need to have water as well as sewer there. And that's going to give you the ability to connect it pretty much to the utilities in place so you can keep it there for a longer period of time. Now, most people that buy a park series are looking specifically for something that will be for full-time living at an RV park or at a mobile home park or a place that they plan on leaving leaving it, setting up residence, or using it as maybe a second home or a second place to live, but it's going to be connected to power and ground utilities pretty much all the time. A destination model gives you some flexibility in terms of taking it out, keeping it, again, at a place with absolutely no connections, nothing available, and still having the ability to use your shower, still having the ability to use the restroom, your sinks, things like that, because you have holding tanks, you have water pump, you have all the things that you would need in order to utilize it out off grid or out in an environment where you just don't have connections. Now, they're both designed to be more of a long-term solution, which means a lot of people will put a destination style trailer at a piece of property that they own that they plan on moving it around or maybe taking it home or taking it somewhere else to another piece of property, maybe every six months, every year, but they don't plan on moving it around too much. Whereas a park series, again, is typically going to find its home in one place and it's probably not going to move very often unless you simply move from one state to another. I know some folks who bought a park unit specifically because they were traveling nurses and when Whenever they would go somewhere, they would be in that place for up to six months and then they would move to another place. But it would always stay at an RV park and having permanent connections there was something that worked for them. So they were perfectly fine with a park series. They did not need the holding tanks. Now, from a construction perspective, Keystone makes a line of them, Forest River makes a line of them. Uh, there's all sorts of brands out there. And you know, you're going to see vastly different construction techniques for different types of units that are out there. Most of them are going to have a very, very similar approach to the overall look where they're going to have that front flat end. They'll typically have some large windows around the front, large windows on the side, a screened sliding door typical to what you might see on a cabin or a home. 
but where you're going to see some construction differences are primarily going to be similar to a standard travel trailer, whether it's going to be a smooth wall side like this or whether it's going to be a corrugated stick and tin unit. And that's simply the difference between it being on a steel frame with wood walls, wood roof, corrugated aluminum running down the side, or it's going to have an aluminum frame with fiberglass running down the side. That's really the only difference between the two of them from a construction perspective. Foam versus batted insulation will also be kind of tied into that. Whether you get the fiberglass look like this, you're typically going to have a foam insulation. And if you get a corrugated aluminum sidewall, it's typically going to have a batted residential style insulation. Both perform pretty much the same. Uh, you know, as with most travel trailers, most RVs, if you get it with the fiberglass sidewall, it tends to look a little better. It tends to hold up a little better in the long run. And it also tends to hold its value quite a bit better, actually. The value you get back during resale is really where you're going to see the biggest benefit in going to a fiberglass sided unit. Now, aluminum is great because it's easy to repair. But if you're going to keep it parked at an area for a long period of time, keep in mind that aluminum units have a lot more wood running through the walls. And when I say aluminum units, I mean the corrugated aluminum siding that you see. So you inherently might open yourself up to wood damage from wood boring insects like termites and things by having that type of unit if it's out at a place for an extended period of time. So just keep that in mind. One of the things that's really nice about some of these larger destination and park style units is also the fact that you can get them in very, very large floor plans, very, very large units, very tall. The overall length of some of these park units can rival that of a fifth wheel, except you don't have the overhang here. It's all RV. And many of them are two story or upper deck units that give you the ability to have a large loft or multiple lofts, as well as large bedrooms, separate bathrooms, all sorts of things that you you can fit into a structure that is the size of a large fifth wheel but doesn't have some of the restraints that your typical travel trailer may have now that being said to tow one of those units you have to be very very careful they have tremendous hitch weights i mean a lot of these units approach 2200 pounds in terms of how much weight would rest on the back of your vehicle and again this weight is resting on the back of your vehicle so keep that in mind we're not talking about a fifth wheel where it's over the axles we're not talking about a typical travel trailer where you might have 800 900 1100 pounds on the hitch of your vehicle behind the axles. We're talking about some of these units that have upwards of 2,200 pounds, which rivals that of mid-size fifth wheels all hanging back several feet behind the axle of your truck. So if you're looking at destination units, a lot of folks actually won't tow them with their own vehicle. They'll hire a contractor that brings a much larger truck out that can handle that type of weight behind the axles easier with more control and more braking power. They'll have it moved where they want it and then it just stays there. But that's pretty much it. When it comes down to them, you know, pricing and things like that, most of your larger destination units, most of your larger park units are going to be roughly the same price as most of your higher end luxury travel trailers, uh, mainly because they might not have upgrades in areas that traditional travel trailers would. Maybe upgraded wheels and tires, upgraded suspension, holding tanks, upgraded, you know, leveling systems, electric tongue jacks, things like that. You may not have a lot of that on a park or a destination model. Again, because it's not really designed to be towed around all over the place. So there's a lot of cost associated with that that can go into the inside of the unit and it turns into almost a wash. You can get some very large destination and park style units at roughly the same price as much smaller, more well-equipped travel trailers in terms of you know the things that they do to make it better to tow. Anyways, guys, I sure hope you've enjoyed this video. I sure hope it answered the question. Uh, it's actually pretty difficult to locate a park model anywhere. You can find destination trailers just about everywhere. That's one of the main reasons that I came out here to uh, our fifth wheel to kind of give you a walk around and show you specifically some of the differences between a destination travel trailer, a park model travel trailer, a standard travel trailer, and a fifth wheel. Guys, if you haven't had a chance, please take a moment, subscribe to my channel, give me a thumbs up, and we'll talk to you again very soon.